please turn in your Bibles to the first letter of Peter. So just flip a few pages to the left there. And uh, as we've been doing, we've been studying through the letter here. Uh, this is actually our 23rd visit in the letter of First Peter. And so uh, my heart has been uh, greatly blessed by studying it. And it's really a great privilege to be able to bring to you the, the key themes in this letter as we go verse by verse. So uh, our text today begins at verse 7 of chapter 4. So 1 Peter 4, 7, and I'm just going to read uh, 7 to 11. And you can see how it relates to what was just read from Peter's second letter. And Peter writes, verse 7, 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is at hand. And therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the title of the message this morning is Ready for Royalty. And I get that from verse 7 when uh, Peter writes, the end of all things is at hand. So it's a general statement, meaning the consummation, um, God's plan for the ages. God is going to bring to a conclusion the things that he's promised to do. We just read about that in 2 Peter, that the elements will burn with a fervent heat, and then God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, there's some debate about all, how, how that will all turn out, uh, but nonetheless, God is going to deal with this uh, sin-cursed creation and remake it, and so all those who know him will be a part of it, and Peter is saying that the end of all things, the, the fulfillment, the consummation of the things that God has promised uh, is at hand. And so in light of that, there's some things to how we should live. Peter in his second letter said, in light of all these things, what kind of people ought we to be? And it's a similar uh, word here today that in light of the end that is at hand, what kind of people should we be? And so uh, from from this text, I see four main points that uh, help us. In other words, how can we live in such a way that we can be ready for royalty? And uh, the royalty meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're taking notes, those four main points are focused prayer, fervent love, and we have, we show fervent love through forgiving each other, and through showing hospitality. So focus prayer, fervent love, faithful stewardship, and then a fundamental purpose. So uh, if we live our life ready for royalty, if, or if we want to be ready for royalty, the return of Jesus and the consummation of all things, then Peter's saying, here's four areas that ought to characterize your life. You know, and I think about being ready for royalty, it makes me think of what happened long ago uh, in 1959, actually. Queen Elizabeth and uh, Prince Philip were on a 45-day, 15,000-mile journey on their royal yacht to celebrate the opening of the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. And of course, that meant that the ocean going vessels could enter the St. Lawrence River and make their way down and find their all the way to Chicago uh, and to other, other major port cities 
on the Great Lakes. So it was a momentous event. A lot of work went into it, a lot of controversy, et cetera. And anyway, so when the plans were laid uh, and the fact that the queen was going to visit Chicago, all kinds of preparations were going to be made. Her visit was going to be quite brief, but nonetheless, everybody was going to make preparations such as uh, litter baskets would be painted and uh, pretty much the red carpet was going to be laid out. And um, many hotels were actually alerted to the fact that Queen Elizabeth is coming. And uh, so they all were, most all were scrambling to, to be ready. But there's one hotel in Chicago, it's called the Drake, D-R-A-K-E, the Drake uh, a pretty famous hotel, actually, one of the most famous in Chicago. When, the, when they contact, when the news or the newspaper reporters were trying to do this story on Queen Elizabeth's visit, they contacted the Drake and they said, well, everybody's making preparations for the Queen. What are you doing to prepare for royalty? And the, uh, the manager of the Drake said, we are making no plans, no special plans for the Queen our rooms are always ready for royalty. And I think that's the idea for us today and what Peter is trying to communicate. We ought not wait until uh, we think Jesus is coming back. Let me tell you, I've lived long enough to hear a lot of stories about when Jesus is coming back. Dates were set. You know, I've heard the stories. Some, some of those were cults who had set dates and, you know, they, people were selling their homes and, you know, basically ruining their lives, leaving their jobs and so on, thinking that Jesus would come back. Uh, we don't know when he's going to come back. We just know that he will, and it could be at any time. That's why Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Uh, we have been living in the end end times since Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension back to the Father, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. When, that, when those events were completed, the last days began. We are in the last days. And if we've been in the last days, <laughs> excuse me, for 2,000 years, we must really be in the last days, if you know what I mean. And so, not knowing when royalty will return, so to speak, Peter's telling us it could be any time. And so we ought to prepare. We ought to be ready for royalty at any time so that when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back, it isn't like, oh, I need to get my life in order. It, it'll be in order because like the Drake Hotel, no special preparations we're always ready for royalty. That's the kind of life that we should live. And these four main points that I shared with you already can really help us with that, that we can have a fervent prayer and our, a focused prayer and fervent love and faithful stewardship and a fundamental purpose for our life. So I'd just like to look at those things briefly this morning. I'm looking forward to Jesus' return. I trust you are as well. When I think about that and the new heaven and the new earth where there will only be righteousness and peace and contrast that with what we see today in our culture, the, the, the demise of, of things that we thought were kind of assumed about what's right and wrong and so on, all that's in question today. Well, when Jesus comes back and he consummates all his promises, those kind of things are going to fade away, and we will be uh, in a new heaven and a new earth, and our faith will become sight, and our struggles with sin will be complete, and we'll, we'll see Jesus, and we'll be made just like him. And Jesus, whose name is often mocked and blasphemed, is going to one day be at center stage where his name will be lifted high and glorified. And because Jesus is king now with all authority under his sovereign power, and because the best is yet to come, and because the best is near, then how should we live? 
and um, some people uh, kind of scoff at the, the end times as far as, well, we don't really know. It doesn't really matter. Uh, well, it really does matter. But it's not only that. It's not only the soon and uh, inexorable, the certain return of Jesus. It's not only that. But the fact is, your life, even if you live to be very, very old, <laughs> your life at its longest is short compared to eternity. And none of us know how long we have. So for the, for the simple reason that the end of all things is near, it, that could certainly refer to the end of your life or mine. And the end of all things being the consummation of the ages, whichever it is, whichever comes first, how should you live? Well, so the first, the first thing that Peter says in the text here, with the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So he's saying, you know, the word itself, uh, self-controlled, means to be in your right mind. It means someone who's reasonable and sensible, who's prudent, whose mind is clear. Uh, a clear mind or a mind that you that could be made clear would be made clear through the word of God, the saturation of the mind with the word of God. It's like what Paul says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So to be self-controlled is to be able to see what's important based on the word of God, what's not important. It's also to have a balanced life, not fanatical about prophecy. The whole purpose of prophecy is not to create charts and, and scare people. The whole the point of prophecy is to ask ourselves, what kind of people are we? Are we really ready for royalty? So the idea is, is to, to be self-controlled. And then he says to be sober-minded. That, that's a, a balanced life. Can, it contains the idea of sobriety as opposed to intoxication. So um, not only does Ephesians 5 tell us to not be drunk with wine. So, you know, that's an issue. In our culture is the use of alcohol. Here it means uh, to be sober, not merely uh, not clouding your mind with drugs and alcohol, but more than that, to be to remain in full possession of your faculties and feelings. Uh, it means to be free from every sort of mental and spiritual drunkenness that results from confusion about. A lot of things, prophecy, end times, all, all sorts of things. So when you know what's coming, that is, Jesus is coming back, and he could return at any moment, and that life is short at its longest, and if your mind is filled with the will of God through the word of God, then we learn to pray. We learn to take things to God, and our prayers, when our minds are saturated with the word of God, that will filter into our prayers. And so our prayers will not be so much as asking God for more comforts in the den or more comforts in the man cave or the she shed or whatever you call it. More, not praying for uh, more comforts for ourselves. although certainly we pray that God would help us if we're troubled or whatever, certainly, but not for a more comfortable life, but our prayers are made, uh, are given a razor edge of prayers for power from God, prayers for wisdom from God, prayers for boldness and courage to speak up, uh, prayers, Lord, give me more love. Lord, give me, give me grace to be patient with so-and-so. Uh, our prayers, uh, uh, while we certainly pray for ourselves, our prayers become intercession. Intercession just simply means praying for on behalf of others and praying for the salvation of the lost, praying for spiritual growth in, in the lives of your brothers and sisters, to, to take the church directory 
uh, or a list of people that you know from our fellowship and make them a part of your prayer list and to pray for them regularly and asking God. And again, I've said this before, when I read through, uh, when I have my morning reading and uh, I read like this week, I read in John, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And so the prayer list that I had for that day, the people on that list, I prayed, Lord, make them lovers of truth, make them speakers of truth, make them truthful people, make them people that have that want nothing more than truth in their life and in the lives of others. And it, it so it it influences our prayer. The word of God influences our prayers to to give us a, a focus. Uh, to focus our prayers on really what is important. And so being reminded of Jesus' return should wake us up to the, the need for focused prayer, prayer for things that, that are on God's heart, prayer for matters that we can't even, we, we can't do a thing about, but we know God cares. And we, and we take it to the Lord and we do this regularly. It's just, it's a, a habit. It's a part of our life. There's power in prayer, and we ought to pray. And every day, seek the face of the Lord. Power comes from the hand of God. Uh, God's power can alter a hopeless circumstance and a shattered relationship. God's power can give us strength to conquer life's daily struggles. The power of God through prayer can heal psychological and physical problems, remove destructive tendencies in marriage. Answers to prayer come about our finances. When we're discouraged, we go to God with it. We just pour our hearts out. We use the Psalms as language to, to say what the, the Holy Spirit gave to Psalm writers to say to God. You know, here's God's word to us to say back to God. That's the Psalms. And there's, some, there's a Psalm for every sorrow and a Psalm for every joy. Uh, there's the, the Bible uh, tells us to pray when we're desperate and when we're not desperate. The Bible's bursting at the seams with examples about how our almighty, omnipotent God loves to answer the prayers of his children. Focused prayer. And, you know, it's possible even to be well versed in the knowledge of prayer, but to fail to have the experience of being a person of prayer, of, you know, going for long walks with God or falling on our knees and, and praying uh, to God, asking God for more faith, uh, grace to, to live each day for him. God delights in responding in a mighty way. And if you've been praying for things to happen, as, as I have been, for God to intervene in people's lives in different ways, and God has seen fit to wait, to, to, it's not answered yet. Can I just encourage you to keep, keep praying? Sometimes the answers to our prayers will come after we are gone. But God holds those prayers and he, and he continues to, to cherish them. Uh, the BFC is um, holding a day of prayer this coming Saturday in um uh, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, it was in the bulletin. I think it was also sent out. That is the way to sign up. But uh, I encourage you to be a part of the day of prayer. Uh, it's not sponsored specifically by our church. It's sponsored by the prayer committee of the Bible Fellowship Church. So, but you can join either by going in person to Newark, Delaware, or to Cedar Crest Church in Allentown or you can join online virtually. So ready for royalty? Well, first thing is a life of prayer, focused prayer. The second way to be ready for royalty is to have fervent love. When Jesus comes back, he wants us, his church, to be a, a loving church. And that's what Peter writes in verse eight, above all, he says, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? So how do we show love? 
Well, we show love by being forgiving. So when we're offended or somebody just rubs us the wrong way or whatever it is, uh, uh, a kind of love, fervent love is a love that is quick to forgive, uh, quick to overlook an offense, uh, quick to cover a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean we cover up sin. Yes, there are times that we need to go to a person because they're definitely in sin. The, the tra trajectory of their life is that they're hurting themselves and others. Certainly, there is a place for that. But there also is, I think, even a greater place for all of us to be patient with each other, to love each other in a way to say, well, they, you know, maybe they didn't quite mean it the way it came across and not to be petty, certainly not to take up an offense, you know, when somebody's offended at, at somebody and that, that offended person goes to a unrelated third person to say, oh, did you know what so-and-so said or did? And now you have two people offended when only one was actually offended, taking up an offense. That, that's not fervent love. Uh, we need to to love, and Peter says we ought to love with an intensity, earnestly. Uh, it it means the word literally means stretched out, a stretched out kind of love. It has the idea of a uh, of a like a horse who's on full gallop, and the you can see that the the the, the animal's legs are stretched out, muscles are tight. They're going at it uh, with uh, all its strength. Uh, it, Similar idea of a runner, you know, coming to the end of the race, two runners almost, I, you know, tied and they're straining forward, their muscles are tight, they're pushing their, their uh, chest out to be the first to cross the finish line. Think of a running back at the one yard line, has the ball and his, he's handed the ball and he's hit, but he, he spins and he turns around and he's running backwards, pushing and pushing, kind of like beast mode. Beast mode love. That's kind of what uh, Peter is, is after. He's saying, love earnestly, intensely. Uh, keep loving. There's a continuity of it, not you know now and then, but he says, keep loving one another. It's a present tense. So let it be the, the tenor of your life, that you're, you're a loving person, and you do this, as we said, by forgiving and we do it also by hospitality. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. He had to add that without grumbling, didn't he? Now he's, now he's meddling, right? But um, hospitality is just something so important in the life of the church. My family has been the recipient of it in the years past. We have tried to in, in uh, years past and whenever and now as much as we can be hospitable. Of course, COVID, you know, uh, limits that. And it's a shame too, because some of the best ministry takes place when we open our lives through opening our homes. As, as uh, Rosario Butterfield has written a book, uh, she, the title is, the gospel, the gospel Comes with a House Key. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, our homes are meant when things are normal, our homes are meant to be uh, mission stations. They're meant to be places where lives are open and there's fellowship and, and uh, we share a meal and uh, we share our lives and, uh, uh, and much, so much good, so much spiritual growth can come as a small group meetings and uh, a one-on-one -on -one discipleship, that kind of thing can occur when they open our homes and, and, uh, you know, we're uh, in a position, in a situation now where our homes are not places for hospitality. They're, they're places for quarantine. And again, we ought to pray, Lord, bring an end to this pandemic, because that's an area of ministry that is, it is like held up. It is, it is hindered greatly. And I, I it's serious. It really is. It's something that we ought to pray against. May God soon put the plague away. But, you know, hospitality doesn't just have to occur in our home. Uh, it can occur uh, in creative places. My wife and I know a couple. Well, they're with the Lord now. Uh, they lived in Mount Pocono. But before, they lived in New York City. And uh, I think I think the gentleman worked on Wall Street. And uh, the church that they attended uh, had a, a good number of college students. And so 
this this couple, the the wife especially, uh, she would cook trays of lasagna and whatever else. It was probably something simple. And they would use a room in the church and they would let the college students know that if you want a, a, a nice hot home cooked meal, you can stay afterward and come to such and such a room and we will feed you. And they did that. I, I don't know that the, the details are sketching, as I said, they're not around anymore, but they did it regularly and they would feed them. And then they would, for the rest of the afternoon, they would just talk with them and they would counsel them and they would just share with them. And only eternity will tell the good that occurred because this couple was hospitable. They, their home wasn't big enough to accommodate uh, the college group that that was in that church in New York City, but they found a room that was, and they brought the food, and and they spent the time, and so they were loving. They were they were giving of themselves and and loving uh, those college students. So so we have focused prayer and fervent love. These are these are ways that that are practice. We ought to practice. Uh, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out, because this is the way we are ready for royalty. No special preparations when Jesus comes back. Why is that? Because we're doing what he's asking us to do. It's just, that's what we ought to be doing. The other thing is faithful stewardship. So focus prayer and fervent love, and then faithful stewardship. That is verse uh, 10, as each has received a gift Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, a a rich supply of God's grace there. Whoever speaks uh, as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So he divides gifts, spiritual gifts into two main parts. One is serving and the other is speaking. So speaking, that would entail uh, what I'm doing now, but not just that, certainly not limited to that, not by any stretch. It can be the public ministry of the word. It can be the private ministry of the word. It can be a a small size settings like uh, we have going with uh, men, men meeting uh, groups of three to, for fellowship and Bible reading and prayer and su- fel- uh, mutual support. It can be speaking in a counseling situation where the word of God, uh, a person's uh, situation is rightly understood, and then the word of God is lovingly applied and uh, given as as the means by which a person can move forward in their Christian life. Uh, it, it has the idea uh, when it says the gift, a gift, no one uh, earned it. These are gifts of God's grace. So whatever spiritual gift you have, whether it's a speaking gift, as I just said, or a, a serving gift where you're um, it's not, not so much speaking, but it's uh, administration or somebody that works behind the scenes, situations that require, you know, helping someone's physical needs. Uh, The deacons certainly model that, excuse me, um, uh, serving where we're we're just helping others. We're uh, organizing things, but we're more behind the scenes, whatever it is. The idea is that we have a gift and it fits into one of those two categories. And it may be that you have a gift, uh, two gifts. You may have one in either category. Uh, But the point is, everyone has a gift. Each one, it says in the text, look at each one, verse 10, each one has received. So no one's left out. Everyone has a place. Everyone, this is why it's so important. Be committed to the church. Be committed and say, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm with you. And I, and I want to use my gift. And if you say, well, I'm not really sure 
you know, what your gift might be, you begin to try things. You ask God, lead me, give, give me some direction as to uh, what I might be able to do. And, you know, use your talents and abilities, use your, you know, your experiences. And what are you passionate about? Um, you know, what do you really have? Uh, what have you done that you others have said, wow, the Lord really uses you when you do that. There are ways to discover a gift, but it's really most important to be active serving and then asking God, is this the area that won't be in or something else? But give it enough time so that you can, you know, you can get a, a good read on it. But uh, so it's either speaking or serving. Everyone, everyone has a gift and it it's not really an option. It says that, you know, Peter writes, use it. Each one has received a gift, use it. <laughs> I mean, I, it's pretty blunt. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Get get going. Use it for God's glory. But but use it. And uh, and so uh, it's a stewardship. So God gave it. He's the source. And he said, "I've given this to you for the benefit of the growth and and lo- spiritual life and flourishing of your brothers and sisters in Christ." Uh, you know, I love my church so much that I've gifted my people and I've, I've put them in, in a local church. And now I, I want each of them to, to use those abilities, the supernaturally uh, empowered abilities that, that glorify me, glorify God, and, and bring good and growth to the body of believers. So it's a stewardship. We're managers of it. We don't have a choice. God gives it and he says, go use it. And some of those parables that Jesus gives, you know, in the gospels about the the parable of the talents, which was not a skill, but a a unit of uh, of money measurement, which was, you know, it was, it was like a, a stimulus plan level of amount of money. And, and then a mina, which is a smaller amount, like three months wages of a laborer, these were, these were uh, resources given to servants. Then the master goes away and the master says, while I'm gone, use it, multiply it. And that's what he wants us to do with these spiritual gifts that he's given to us. There's a variety of them. As he says, they're broken down into two categories, but there's just a a, a spectrum, a, 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 a varied, all kinds. We need all kinds, you know. Don't say, well, I'm not like so-and-so, you know, 1 Corinthians 12. Well, the eye cannot say to the hand, you know, I'm not needed because, you know, I sure wish I was a hand like you. I'm just an eye, you know. Who? Yeah, it, That's absurd. We, we, Everyone is needed. Everyone has a place. And uh, be a good steward. Be, uh, use this variety for, for the... God's purposes. You know, nobody has all the gifts. Nobody has it all together. If you get that impression, um, you know, you say, well, people, they try to make it look like they have it all together. That's not the case. The reality is, you know, if we have struggles or issues in our life, it, you know, we, we're careful who we share those with. And uh, we certainly, we're not going to go around telling every last little person every one of our last little struggles, we ought to have a relationship with people before we do that. But nobody has it together. And we all have flat sides, but we all have a gift. It reminds me of uh, what Mike Mike Royko, who is a columnist in Chicago, he wrote a book, One More uh, More Time. And uh, he writes in his book about a, a Christmas tree salesman named Slats Grobnik. What a name, right? Slats Grobnik. And Slats was selling Christmas trees just before Christmas. And he noticed this uh, young couple came up to his, uh, his little area where he sold trees. And they were looking at all the, all the trees. And he could tell that, you know, they probably didn't have a lot of money. And, and they kept looking at the price tags and then saying, uh, you know, he could tell that uh, they probably weren't going to buy one of those expensive trees. And they came upon uh, two trees, Scotch pines, and uh, they were very similar. They they each had one good side and they each had one really 
barren side, really kind of flat, so to speak, uh, not many needles and kind of looking a little uh, drab. And she whispered something in his ear, uh, you know, the wife to the husband and the husband said to Slats, he said, take three dollars for both of them. And uh, Slats said, you know, I'm probably not going to sell them anyway. So he said, yeah, you can have them both for three, three bucks. So they, took, they gladly took the two trees home. Well, Slats was r- walking down the street because his tree stand was pretty near their apartment. And he was walking by a couple evenings later in a, in a basement apartment. And he saw this beautiful tree in the window, just gorgeous. And uh, he, it, he says it was thick and well-rounded. And so he knocked on the door to ask how they got it to look so good. And they told him uh, they worked the two trees close together where the branches were thin. And then they tied the trunks together. The branches overlapped and formed a tree so thick you couldn't see the wire that held the two together. And Slats described it as a tiny forest of its own. And so Slat says, so that's the secret. You take two trees that aren't perfect, that have flaws, that might even be homely. You put them together just right, and you come up with something really beautiful. And that is the body of Christ. Nobody has it all together. Don't, and if it appears that way, just get to know people a little bit better. Uh, and just realize that everybody has a flat side. But we put, we put our gifts together. And God works it. God uses it. And he uses imperfect vessels like you and me uh, to accomplish his good work. So that's our role as faithful stewards. We use the gifts that God gives us. And a healthy church will emphasize mutual commitment to one another and the stewardship of our spiritual gifts for the purpose of building each other up. And that's what we intend to do. And finally, it's ready for royalty? Well, focused prayer, fervent love, faithful stewardship, and a fundamental purpose to bring glory to God. That See, we can do all those other things, but if our motive is, if we're not driven by that, that God would be seen for who he is in his magnificent splendor, if, if we're not really, if, if what we do, if why we do what we do is simply to aggrandize ourselves, to promote ourselves, then it's not going to work. It's going to fall short. But if we have as our goal God's glory, that's going to help us stay with things, persevere, because we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for Almighty God. That's going to keep us persevering even when there are obstacles. It's a it's a fundamental purpose that gets us ready for uh, royalty. That <clears throat> we say, Lord, I want to do this for for your glory. I want to use my gifts for the spread of your fame to more and more people. Like Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when we speak God's truth, right? We speak the oracles of God. We're not speaking our ideas. We bring glory to God because we're sharing his word. When we share answers to problems with people from the word of God, God gets the glory, not uh, or so smart kind of glory, but God's answers. We serve by the strength of God. That's what Peter said. Uh, When God gives us strength, we persevere. People realize that this is a work of God, and God God gets the glory. Somebody who depends on God's strength, you'll often hear them say something like this. Hey, look, let's commit this task, this day, this problem, this need. Let's commit it to the Lord. You know, God will help us. Let's do that. And then God answers prayer, right? Back to, you know, focus prayer. God answers and God gets the glory. Why did he create you? He created you that you would glorify him. That's why you're here. 
Use all your gifts. Pray. Love. Why? Because God made you for the very purpose of glorifying himself through you. Just as a telescope brings into view what is unimaginably great, so the purpose of our life is to display God's greatness and majesty. And when this occurs, when God is being glorified through our life, the purpose for which he made us is being fulfilled. I don't know about you, but that excites me to know that I have found my purpose and I can day by day seek to accomplish that, to to glorify God. Point people to him, not to yourself. And so that all our serving and our speaking, all that we do and using our gifts, it all points, points to God. So the end of all things is near. Pray, love, serve, speak, and glorify God. Display him to others. And if that's how, if that's how you live day by day, you can be sure that God is being glorified. And you can also be sure that you're ready for royalty because royalty is coming. And it's going to be a glorious day. Keep it in, keep it in mind as you serve him. Now, next week, God willing, uh, we'll be together. Uh, in person, and we're going to look at the uh, the last verses of chapter four, uh, back to the issue of suffering. And uh, there's some interesting verses there, uh, you know, for this time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be of the ungodly? In other words, what does God mean by all of that? And uh, how do we entrust our soul to a faithful creator? And um, so suffering, it's a one of the main topics, the main themes in Peter. And we return to it again next week. Evidently, God wants us to hear it. And so we will. But for now, uh, I'm going to pray. And uh, then I have just a few announcements to, to share. Right about now, we'd have a closing song. But uh, I'm going to pray and then have announcements. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you truly are royalty. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the faithful and true, who is the king of all, who has uh, all authority in heaven and earth, that all all kings and princes and authorities and uh, uh, the whole unseen world has been made subject to him. We don't see it yet, Lord. And that's the hard part, but we know it's coming. We know that we have a foretaste of it now, but we know that one day you will consummate the ages. Help us to live, Lord, in such a way that we're ready for royalty, for Jesus to return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.